grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. While we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Well, do please take a seat. And as we commit ourselves to the service of God, let us confess our sins, that our relationship with him might be restored. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith, saying, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse and forgive you from all your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The wonderful thing about the forgiveness of God is that it restores our relationship with him, but also it is the basis of a relationship that we have with one another. Uh, the unity that we can share is because of what Christ has done. Shall we stand and declare um, the praises of God through Psalm 133 together? How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, do please take a seat for our first reading. <clears throat> the first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. It's on page <clears throat> 1115 in the Bibles. So, chapter 19. <clears throat> While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, <clears throat> John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Here ends the reading. Well, our next hymn that we'll sing together picks up the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist that declares Jesus to be the Son of God. 
revealing his place in that plan of salvation. Shall we stand and sing together? The second reading can be found on page 1063, 1063 in the Church Bibles. We're reading from John's Gospel, chapter 1, and verses 19 to 36. That's John 1, 19 to 36. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent to question him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me, has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. <clears throat> then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove 
and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Would you open it for us now, please, by your spirit, and show us what you would have us, the Church of St. John the Baptist in Burford, how you would have us understand and what you would have us do, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've uh, recently joined the team of volunteer welcomers here, um, and I've really enjoyed showing people around and trying to answer their questions. I say trying to answer their questions because some of them are a little bit complicated. I think the easiest question I've had to deal with is where's the toilet? Um, but the stained glass windows seem to attract a lot of attention, so I found myself answering a lot of questions about the stained glass windows, and I'm still learning what they're all about. I've got my head around the Jesse window there, and I've the, the wall window over in that transept. The rest of them I'm still learning about. But on the subject of stained glass windows, there is one stained glass window that I know extremely well, not in this building, it's not that far from here, it's the east window in the church at South Lee. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, it's not an ancient window, I think the age is probably somewhere around about the late Victorian period. And the subject of the East Window at, John, at uh, South Lee Church is John the Baptist. And he takes centre stage, if you can picture it, right in the foreground, in the centre of the window, is John the Baptist. And clustered around him, there are a, a number of people of all ages, some sitting, some standing, some, I think some even kneeling. And they're all gazing up at John with rapt attention, listening to what he has to say. There is another figure in the window, sort of back in the distance, walking from left to right across the scene, as it were, and that figure is Jesus, smaller and in the distance. John the Baptist is pointing in this picture at Jesus, and the caption in the window, it's in Latin, but it says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the thing that really interests me about that window, about the way the picture has been portrayed, is that not one single person in the crowd around John the Baptist is following John's pointing finger. No one is turning around to look over their shoulder to see who he's talking about. Every single one of them is still gazing at John. And it strikes me that uh, that window, in a way, forms a link between our two Bible readings today. In the second reading from John 1, we had the very scene that the, the, the window portrays. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But I think there's also a link to Acts 19. In Acts 19, we have the story of Paul the Apostle arriving in Ephesus and he meets with the Church of John the Baptist, Ephesus. No, he doesn't really. They're not really called that at all. What the Bible actually says is he found a group of disciples. But I call them, you know, tongue-in-cheek, I call them the Church of St. John the Baptist, Ephesus, because that's who they were focused on. In a way, they were just like that group of people in the South Lee window who were looking to no one else other than, than John the Baptist. Somehow they managed to miss John's pointing finger. Somehow, we're told, they missed the day of Pentecost. John, uh, Paul says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, no, no there was one. Uh, they had missed the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Now that's not quite so clearly spelled out, but they had not been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Now, being baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, that dying and rising says, here's the one who died for my sins and rose again. And by being baptized, I am joining him and I'm saying, what he did for me is for me. I accept the salvation that he holds out to me. And those 12 people, it says 12 men, doesn't it? I uh, guess there may have been some women and children as well. Those, those people in Ephesus had somehow missed Jesus. It's not that they didn't know that they were sinners who needed to repent. It's not that they didn't know uh, about the need to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. What they didn't seem to know was who the Messiah was. They didn't seem to know how forgiveness could be obtained. They didn't know that Jesus paid the price for their sins. So, as we celebrate this church's patronal festival, uh, here's a question to ponder. What does it actually mean to be a church that is named after John the Baptist? What is the significance of having that name? I have to say, I'm quite glad that it is St. John the Baptist. If this church were named after St. Simeon Stylites, I think I'd be asking Tom to get somebody else to preach. What's the significance of being a church named after John the Baptist? Well, I just want to make two points. I was trained to make three points, but uh, that was a long time ago, so you'll just have to make do with two points this morning. Um, the first point I want to make is that a church, not just the church of St. John the Baptist, but any church needs to have the same focus as John the Baptist, the same focus. John's perfectly clear. He does not beat around the bush. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. John's focus was very definitely not on himself. When the Jewish authorities turned up to interrogate him, he said, he confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Now, actually, that made John the Baptist a very unusual figure because there was a huge amount of Messiah frenzy in those days. Messiahs were popping out of the woodwork left, right, and center saying, I'll deliver you from the Romans. Acts 5 mentions just two of them, Judas and Judas the Galilean. We don't know anything else about them apart from the fact that their rebellions fizzled out very quickly. So there was this huge amount of, I'm the Messiah, follow me, follow me, follow me. And now here comes John the Baptist, instantly popular, really charismatic, and like all the others, he says, don't look at me, I'm nobody special. A bit later on in the gospel, John's disciples get a bit agitated because Jesus seems to be getting more followers. Uh, in John 3, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man was, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. Like, John, the polls are showing that there is an immense swing towards the Jesus party. If you don't step up your campaign, you're going to lose this election. And John's not having any of it. He says in so many words, look, if this is a marriage celebration, and it is, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm not the one who will carry off the bride. I'm just the best man. Glad to be here, glad to help, glad to celebrate. But it's not my day. And in verse John 3.30, he says, he must increase, I must decrease. The church that's named after John the Baptist will share John's focus on Jesus. And of course, that's true of any and every church, even St. Simeon Stylites, if there is one. Our focus is Jesus, but let's be honest, it is so easy, isn't it, to let our focus slip onto other things. It can be the building we worship in. We were having a conversation before the service about Exeter Cathedral. I was sort of an honorary member of the staff at Exeter Cathedral. It's a glorious building. I've really enjoyed being in it, but it wasn't my focus. Well, it shouldn't have been anyway. Or it might be the music we sing or the liturgy we say. It's very easy for them to, them to become the focus, the thing of greatest importance. Now, look, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that there is anything wrong with buildings, the music, the liturgy. Uh, 
they are important. They are a little bit like John the Baptist. They're like the best man at the wedding. Great to have. Great to be helped by them. We couldn't do without them. But at the end of the day, they're simply there, like John the Baptist, to point us, to focus us on Jesus. It says uh, in John 1, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. That's what it's about. Our focus is on him so that we may help others to follow Jesus. So that was my first point, John's focus. But secondly, we also share John's frustration. Now, I know that seems an odd thing to say on a patronal festival Sunday. We should be celebrating, not getting frustrated, surely. Well, let me try to explain what I mean. It's often said that John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets, which, again, may sound a little odd because, after all, he's in the New Testament. So how can he be part of the, the Old Testament? If you think of the Old and New Testaments as two pieces of jigsaw that fit together, I can't do jigsaw with ten fingers, but you know what I mean. Old Testament piece, New Testament piece. Old Testament, New Testament. If you think of John the Baptist as part of the Old Testament piece, but he's that round bit that sticks out and slots into the space in the New Testament piece. So they've got one overarching story, a single story, and John is part of of the Old Testament line of prophets, but his sphere of operation is in the New Testament. And like the Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist prophesies the coming of the Messiah. Like the Old Testament prophets, he foretells the coming of the Day of Judgment. And you can see that most clearly in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, in Matthew 3, 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's John prophesying the coming of the Messiah. Because when Messiah comes, the kingdom comes. And he says he's really close at hand. He's round the corner. It won't be long. But then in the same passage, John says this. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Now that is John prophesying the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Now we know it started in a way in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, but it will only be completed on that final day when the Lord Jesus returns and justice is meted out. So the Holy Spirit is giving John the Baptist a vision of two things that lie in his future. The arrival of the Messiah, which is, you know, as far as John's concerned, is a few days away, and the day of judgment, which is actually much, much further away in the future. It's a little bit like looking uh, at a mountain range through a telescope. You can see two mountain peaks, and through the telescope, they actually look as if they're next to each other. But actually, one is much closer than the other. One is much further. The distant peak, the further away one, is much bigger. But the foreshortened perspective in the telescope makes it look as if they're side by side. You can't see the distance between them. John saw those two things, the coming of the Messiah, the day of judgment, and his vision was God-given and true. But what he hadn't been given was the timing, the distance between them. And that led to some frustration. And one day the frustration bubbles over. Luke 7, it says, John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Did I get it wrong, Jesus, that day? I said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and I pointed at you. I was expecting you to come, and you came. But I was expecting you to punish sinners, and you, you, you haven't done it. And there's a frustration there. And let's be honest, it's a frustration, it's the kind of frustration that we can all feel. Have you ever found yourself muttering, I don't know what the world is coming to? I've often said, if there's one thing you should never ever hear Christians saying, it's, I don't know what the world is coming to. Because if we've read the Bible, we do. 
But how on earth can God allow suffering and evil? Where is God in Russia and Ukraine? Where is God in Israel and Gaza? Where is God when when young children die of cancer? If God is God by now, should we not have had the day when all that stuff gets sorted out? And it's frustrating. And it means that today there are many people looking for someone else. People rejecting the Christian faith, experimenting with other belief systems because they think Christianity doesn't work. Now look, there are no glib, easy answers to the problem of evil and suffering. We struggle with it. Of course we struggle with it. But I'd just like to look for a moment at what Jesus says in reply to that question. Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not fall away on account of me. What's Jesus saying? You might be frustrated at the weight. Frustrated because things aren't happening as you thought they should. But go and talk about the good stuff that is happening. Has God blessed anyone? Talk about it. Share it. People need to be encouraged. Has the good news of Jesus made any difference in anyone's lives? Do you know about it? Let's talk about that. Has there been a real answer to prayer? Share it so that we can give God the glory. Testify to what God is doing in your life, in the life of your church, in the life of the world. Share it and talk about it. What is it that Christians talk about over coffee after church? What is it that PCCs talk about on their agendas? Is there room in those conversations and on those agendas for some news, some encouragement about what we've seen God doing? how he's affected lives, how he has brought people out of suffering, how he has uh, blessed people and answered prayer. Now, look, it's not going to make Russia, Ukraine go away. That's not going to make Israel, Gaza disappear. But in our frustration about a sick and hurting world, we will nevertheless be encouraged and strengthened in our trust in Jesus when we see what he is doing we will see the kingdom really is advancing. So, two things, focus and frustration. John was focused on Jesus. He felt a frustration. But it's Jesus who says about that, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that in Jesus you have provided the perfect sacrifice for sin. You have provided the ruler who will return and establish justice and right. Lord, would you on this day when we remember with gratitude the life and ministry of John the Baptist, would you strengthen our focus on Jesus? And would you strengthen our trust in him as we work and witness and serve in a troubled and hurting world. And Lord, may the glory always be yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stephen, thank you very much. One opportunity for us to respond to declare our faith and trust in our God as Father, Son, and Spirit, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the one who came, who was crucified, died, and was buried, descended uh, and rose, and now will come as judge. Shall we stand and declare our faith together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We've declared our trust in the Lord Jesus, and we'll continue to do so uh, in our next song before we have our time of intercession. Let's remain standing as we sing. Do please take a seat. I'll lead us in the collect for today and uh, the collect uh, recognising and remembering the birth of John the Baptist before Penelope leads us. Almighty God, by whose providence your servant John the Baptist was wonderfully born and sent to prepare the way of your son our Saviour by the preaching of repentance, lead us to repent according to his preaching and after his example, constantly to speak the truth, boldly to rebuke vice, and patiently to suffer for the truth's sake. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, who sent your servant John the Baptist to bear witness to Christ and to prepare the way of his coming, help us to heed his message of repentance and amendment of life and to follow his example of boldness and self-denial. We thank you for this building bearing his name, ancient and beautiful, and for all past clergy and those who've worshipped here through the ages 
and the many who have been baptized and married here. Let us pause to remember some of them now. Now it is our turn to enjoy and care for this building, but we also have a neighborhood to serve and a gospel to proclaim. So help us as we try and reach out to Burford and to welcome and minister the many visitors who come from all over the world, that they may find peace, inspiration, as well as history here. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to reach out and draw others to you. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our clergy team, led by Tom, and for Stephen here with us today, expounding the riches of the Bible to us on Sundays, but also with courses and extra teaching and personal help. And for those who teach our children and young people, shaping their lives with knowledge and understanding of the Bible, pointing us all to Jesus. We look forward to welcoming Tim, our curate, about to begin his ministry here, and we ask you to bless the family as they settle in. This church resounds with music for your praise and glory. We thank you for Philip playing the organ today and all the other musicians who enrich our worship and for concerts and outreach events when we can share our church with others. Lord, in your mercy. In the world at this time, with its wars, pain and evil, waste and want, help us to know that your light does shine in the darkness and that your kingdom will come on earth when all will be made right. We bring to you, Lord, those involved in war and conflict, those who are struggling with illness in hospital or at home, those recently bereaved, remembering especially the family of Joe Glyde at Fulbrook, much loved and missed. Help them to trust you and to know that you are with them in their deepest need. Lord, in your mercy. We now praise you, Heavenly Father, for morning light and the gift of this new day. Rejoicing in the fellowship of John the Baptist and all your saints, we commit ourselves and all Christian people to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers. Take for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so let us gather our prayers and praise into one. As our Saviour taught us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we close our time together, we'll join with those who have gone before us, who praise the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenlies and with the angels. We'll stand and sing together, but let me just highlight that the words and thrones on, verse, on line three actually fits at the end of line two, otherwise you'll get very confused. So uh, just keep the and thrones at the end of line two. Shall we stand and let's sing?
and to make the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord and the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you and those for whom you pray this day and forevermore. Amen.